Ned Kelly was an Australian bushranger who became one of the most famous Australian rural outlaws of all time. He was a man who would stop at nothing to make financial gains, and he was involved in a number of police shootings and robberies, and is remembered for being an infamous and notorious criminal. For some Australians, he is considered a heroic anti-establishment figure who fought corrupt British colonists, but to others he was a vicious brute who murdered free police officers. But eventually the law caught up with him, and on the 11th of November 1880, he was executed and hanged at Old Melbourne Jail. Many had rallied in the weeks before his execution to get him a reprieve, and 32,000 people even signed a petition to try and secure his release. But what is the captivating and interesting story of Ned Kelly and his execution? Join us today as we find out, and remember to support our channel. Please make sure to subscribe. Ned Kelly was born between December 1854 and June 1855 in Beveridge in Victoria. He was the oldest son of eight children to John Red Kelly and Ellen Quinn. As a child he had a rather interesting upbringing, and he once saved another boy from drowning, and with this was awarded a green silk sash for bravery. His family did not prosper though, and his father drank heavily, and following moving to another town, the family attracted the attention of the local police. Ned went to school, but his father was sentenced to six months hard labour for stealing a calf, and the family could not pay the fine. The following year the Kellys moved again, and Ned's uncle was convicted of arson, and he was sentenced to death, but this was later commuted to hard labour. But at the age of 14, Ned met Harry Power, and the pair turned to bush ranging in northeastern Victoria. The Kellys were then part of a group who attempted to steal horses, and Ned's first brush with the law came when he had an altercation with a Chinese pig dealer. Ned robbed him of ten shillings, but was then beaten by a stick. But back with Harry Power, Ned conducted a number of armed robberies in April 1870, and he was captured and then imprisoned. Two of the charges of robbery were dismissed, but Kelly was sent to a lockup and was then freed within a month. But another assault charge led Ned to being imprisoned for three months. Three weeks following his release, he was involved in another altercation where he was caught on a stolen horse and then was arrested by a constable. This incident caused Kelly to be pistol whipped by the police officer until his head became a mass of raw and bleeding flesh. Kelly was charged before stealing and he served the sentence yet again. But to settle the score with the horsebreaker who had caused his imprisonment, Kelly fought him in a 20 round boxing match where he was declared the winner and the boxing champion of the district. After his release from jail, Kelly worked as a timber cutter and a labourer, but in April 1878, a police officer called Fitzpatrick went to the Kelly home to arrest Ned's brother Dan for stealing horses. During this, a police officer was shot in the wrist by Ned and their mother Ellen was arrested for aiding and abetting an attempted murder. Ellen was sentenced to three years imprisonment and Ned and Dan then went into hiding. They were joined by Ned's friend Joe Byrne and Dan's friend Steve Hart. During the incident it was said that Ned rushed through the door and fired a shot at Fitzpatrick, missing him, but then Ned's mother hit him over the head with a shovel and during the struggle two more shots were fired which wounded Fitzpatrick's wrist. The Kelly's family's version of events said, the witness which can prove Fitzpatrick's falsehood can be found by advertising, and if this is not done immediately, horrible disasters shall follow. Fitzpatrick shall be the cause of greater slaughter to the rising generation that St. Patrick was to the snakes and toads in Ireland. For had I robbed, plundered, ravished, and murdered everything I met, my character could not be painted blacker than it at present, but thank God my conscience is as clear as the snow in Peru." It was also alleged that Ned shot Fitzpatrick after the constable made inappropriate advances on Ned's sister Kate, who was just 14 at the time. But in October 1878, Ned, Dan, Joe and Steve were heading for Bullock Creek, and here they hoped they would earn enough money to try and appeal Ellen Kelly's sentence. They planned to run a whiskey distillery, but when they arrived they received a warning that four policemen were on their tail and were trying to track them down. Ned rode the surrounding areas and found horse tracks leading to Stringybark Creek, near where the gang of policemen were camped. Ned Kelly and his group ambushed the police at Stringybark Creek, and they found two of the four policemen. They found constables Lonigan and McIntyre stood around a fire, and then the gang drew their guns, and Ned shot Lonigan, but McIntyre surrendered. Lonigan was killed, 
and then the gang questioned McIntyre with their guns pointed at him. At 5.30pm, Kennedy and Scanlon, the other constables, returned on horseback, and Kelly's gang then hid themselves. The Kelly gang then ambushed them, and Scanlon was shot, but then Kennedy dismounted and tried to surrender, but the gang continued to fire at him. Kennedy turned around to face Ned, and Ned shot him in the chest with his shotgun, and in the exchange of gunfire, McIntyre had managed to escape. He reached the Mansfield police station, and then the following day the bodies of Lonergan and Scanlon were recovered, before Kennedy's was found two days later. The bodies had all been looted, and showed that Lonergan had been shot three times, including through the right eye. Scanlon had four bullet wounds, and Kennedy had at least two. But with this brazen slaughter of three police constables, Ned Kelly and his gang were officially outlaws and were referred to as a notorious Kelly gang. Sizable rewards were offered for their capture, and because they were outlaws, members of the gang could be killed without challenge, and this made the Kelly gang hunted. After the police killings, the gang attempted to escape unsuccessfully, and avoided the police narrowly a number of times. They planned to rob a bank in the town of Euroa to get some money as they were short. The gang held up a substation and passers-by were taken hostage in the homestead. Telegraph wires were cut, shutting off Euroa to the outside world. But then the gang members gained entry to the National Bank inside the settlement, and they emptied the safe and cashier's drawers, making off with over £2,000 of money and gold. But the Kelly gang were becoming a major problem, and a number of sympathisers to them were being arrested and remanded in custody for this. Following the bank raid, the reward for Ned's capture was increased, and the gang gave most of the proceeds of the raids to their associates, family and friends. But they needed money yet again. They went to the police barracks at Geraldery, and then took some policemen hostage. They prepared to raid the bank whilst the town were at church, and Ned dressed in a police uniform, and went into the main street with the gang. They held the hotel staff hostage, which was next door to the bank, and then they raided it. They made off again with over £2,000 worth of cash, and much more jewellery and valuables. The reward for them was up to gain, and the police received many reports of sightings of the outlaws, but they then went on the run for almost a year, and the police could not get anywhere near them. But around this time, the Kelly gang began to create suits of armour cast from mould boards, the thick metal parts of a farmer's plough. They realised they needed some protection as they were considered outlaws, and the suits of armour allowed the gang to walk away from close-range shooting. But this also made them seem larger, more intimidating, and greatly feared. Seeing Ned Kelly appear in a large metal suit of armour gave him a huge advantage psychologically over the police, and this led to a confrontation with them at Glen Rowan. Wearing the armour though reduced his mobility and impaired his chances of escape. Police watch parties monitored the relatives of the gang, including that of Joe Burns mother. The police used a neighbour's house named Aaron Sherritt to do this, and Ned found out about this. Ned then sent Sherritt messages saying that many people wanted him dead, and that he was a dead man walking if he continued to help the police. On the 26th of June 1880, two gang members arrived where Sherritt was staying and shot him in the throat and chest with a shotgun. Byrne entered the hut and four policemen were hiding in the bedroom, and he heard the police reaching for their shotguns. But the outlaws then left the hut, and threatened to burn the police alive. The gang knew that reinforcements would be sent to the area, and they planned to derail the trains holding these reinforcements, and then shoot dead any survivors. They would also blow up the police barracks and run riot. Ned tried to damage the tracks at Glen Rowan but failed to, and he then paid some labourers to finish the job. The gang gathered at the railway station in Glen Rowan, and the pack horses they had also had bullet repelling armour. The train did not arrive, and Ned then allowed 21 hostages to leave, who he thought were trustworthy. The police train Ned had been expecting then left late, but danger was alerted before it derailed. The police arrived and a huge firefight occurred. Someone shouted out to the police that there were women and children inside the building they were firing upon, but during the fighting Ned was wounded in the left hand, arm and foot. Two hostages were killed by police fire, and during the lull in firing, a number of hostages escaped. Ned Kelly was bleeding heavily, and he went around the back of the hotel, and made his way into the bush, and the police surrounded the hotel, and firing continued into the night. Byrne was fatally killed, but seriously wounded Ned Kelly lay in the bush for most of the evening. At dawn, dressed in his armour, and armed with three handguns, he emerged and attacked the police from the rear. An eyewitness said, with the steam rising from the ground, it looked for all the world like the ghost of Hamlet's father, with no head, 
only a very long, thick neck. It was the most extraordinary sight I ever saw or read of in my life, and I felt fairly spellbound with wonder, and I could not stir or speak. He was described as a devil, and was firing at the police, and he staggered under the weight of his armour, and had limited vision under his helmet. For half an hour he kept on fighting, and then Ned was brought down by two shotgun blasts to the legs and thighs. He was disarmed and a doctor tended to his wounds. The siege then continued, and the building was set on fire, and inside the police recovered the badly burned bodies of the remaining gang members. But Ned Kelly survived to stand trial on the 19th of October 1889 in Melbourne. Kelly was presented on the charge of murdering police constables, but was never charged with the murder of Sergeant Kennedy. He was convicted of murder and was sentenced to death by hanging, and the judge ended with, May God have mercy on your soul, to which Kelly replied with, I will go a little further than that, and say I will see you there where I go. On the 3rd of November 1880, it was decided that Kelly would be executed eight days later, on the 11th of November, at the old Melbourne jail. As mentioned, there was great support for Ned Kelly, and many believed he was a hero, but the day before his execution he had his portrait taken, as a keepsake for his family, and he was allowed to speak with his relatives. His mother told him to die like a Kelly, but the following morning he was informed within the hour that he was to be executed. At 9am his leg irons were removed, and then he was led out by the guards, accompanied by the chaplain of the prison. When he passed the jail's garden, he commented on how beautiful the flowers were. There has been some debate as to what his final words were, as some reported they were, such as life or are well, I suppose it had to come to this, but another account says how he intended to make a speech, but instead made no sound. He was led into the execution chamber of the prison, where there was a wooden beam above with the noose secured to it. It was said that around nine o'clock crowds began to gather, and that there were over 5,000 people present, including even some children. Some had been given tickets to see Ned's execution, and the final arrangements had been made. Some spectators followed into the execution chamber where the gallows was found, but only the sheriff and sub-sheriff and a doctor and a few officials were allowed near the trap door. The witnesses were below in the corridors underneath, and at ten o'clock the executioner was summoned, who was a man of around sixty years old. He did not cover his face, and then he secured Ned's arms tightly at the elbows, and Kelly was led out to near the trap door. A priest carrying a large cross stood next to him, and then the executioner came forward and placed a noose and rope over the strong overhead beam, then around the neck of the condemned. Following this, the final checks were made, then Ned Kelly plunged through the trap door, and he was executed and pronounced dead. Ned Kelly has gone down in history as one of the most infamous outlaws who caused chaos in Australia. He murdered many people, and became one of the most notorious criminals of the 19th century. His execution was a divisive one, and he was viewed as a hero by some people within Australia. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, Please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.